So here we are at Hack Green. As you can see the bunker in the background there and we've got the living history displays which we'll have a look look round as the day goes on. It's the Saturday today, so get round here and have a look. Soviets in the corner there, mainly Afghan era display going on there. We can go radio truck and we have an RAF display here by the Jack Provost, which we'll go and have a look at in a bit more detail in just a moment or two. So I'm just going to run through the stuff I'm wearing here, which is obviously for post-war Home Guard, the 1950s iteration of the Home Guard, and we'll start at the top and work down. We have the Mark II helmet, Mark II steel helmet with a helmet net on, as you can see. Change from wartime, or certainly the Home Guard post-war seem to have, have done this, is wearing the uh, elastic chin strap, more commonly associated with the Mark III helmet. Uh, so that's the headgear uh, that we're wearing here. We have uh, the battle dress blouse here is obviously 1949 pattern. I have done a separate video on this, which I'll link in the video so you can go and have a look at that in more detail if you wish to. It has its specific home guard insignia here, which is on, you can see, is the shoulder title and then the uh, regional title there. Um, the web equipment worn is 1937 pattern, worn in a slightly unusual manner, which I will show a bit more clearly with it laid out on the ground. So here you can see the web equipment uh, laid out on the ground and you can see the unusual way this is done there's no braces supporting the belt on the pouches it's simply that they are put on and then the haversack is put on the back and the hooks on the l-strap support the ammunition pouches so there's no water bottle or entrenching tool or anything like that it's literally just pouches bayonet frog belt and the haversack standard weapon here you can see is the number four rifle uh, the home guard were also issued the mark three bren and the mark two stem uh, seemingly at this time based on photographs ammunition seems to have been quite limited in terms of what was carried in the pouches so we have an em the left hand pouch here is actually uh, empty and the right hand pouch here just has a, a bandolier of uh, 50 rounds in there. Moving down we have the standard 49 pattern battle dress trousers and then boots and uh, anklets at the bottom there which are standard issue ammunition boots. Uh, they were shiny at the start of the day they've had Unfortunately, I had the toe cap sanded off a bit by walking around in all the, the gravel and everything here. And so I'll just do a turn around now so you can see the full uniform. And as you can see at the back there with the belt, there's no braces supporting the back of the belt. So that's it. That's the basic Home Guard, post-war Home Guard kit. And here we can see Alan in his uniform and the, the ranks of the Home Guard would seem to have followed those of the, the army at this time, as would be expected. And you can see here Alan's uh, blouse is badged up as sergeant. And when not wearing the helmet, the regimental cap badge was worn, uh, based on district, of course, uh, on the stand by then standard uh, midnight blue beret. And you can see otherwise the uniform is the same. Uh, battle dress with boots, anklets and belt, when not wearing uh, full web equipment. So basically very similar to the British Army soldier of the time. Here you can see the display we have set up. So we have the weapons used by the 1950s iteration of the Home Guard. We've got a Mark III Bren there. You can see a Mark II Sten gun. Uh, and then we have a number four rifle down the front here and obviously the web set we've already had a look at the way the webbing equipment set up there uh, a couple of mark ii helmets there we've got the home guard training manual from 1952 which basically condenses down a lot of the wartime uh, training manuals into one bigger uh, how to do everything manual and at the back there we have the uh, spare barrel bag and the uh, Bren uh, wallet with the various cleaning tools and so forth in there and you can see we do have a spare barrel for the Bren underneath there as well. So this is the, the basic sort of display we have of the kit and equipment that was used which is very Spartan but sometimes less is more. Just for interest sake we have here an original 1950, very late 1950s Blue A stove making tea. Uh, I might do a separate video on this if people are interested in it but this is circa 1958-59 just pre-60s. I also have a 60s example with me as well. You can see the cover for it in the background there. When you fold the um, fold the stand in, uh, it fits into that cover there. It looks almost like a rocket. Uh, very of its time in that regard. So yeah, just have this uh, on the go, making some tea. Okay, so here we are with the RAF display, and we're gonna David's gonna run us through some of the bits yeah, and pieces we've got on display here. There's a bit of a timeline going on. Yeah, that's a bit. So have a look at the table first, or do you want to look uh, we'll at the flying the suits? Right, okie dokie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've got very late war, immediate post-war, which is the bean suit. Uh, as I say, came very in very late war. We've got the 1941 Main West, which we're using just up into the 50s, I think. Um, 41 pattern gloves, C-type helmet, G-type mask, and Mark 8 goggles. We've also got a back-type parachute harness. Um, not entirely sure the dates of these, but the webbing would suggest pretty damn early. We've 
with them going into the 50s and 60s with the Mark IIa um, flight suits and the Mark IV LSJ uh, May West. Um, and LSJ is a life-saving jacket. Yes, that's the one. Uh, the massive leap to early 80s. This is set out for, for, um, for the Falklands. Uh, it's a Mark 14 flight suit, a, I think a Mark 25 May West, uh, Mark 3 Bone Dome. Um, there's not much else to say about that one. And we leap again to 1991. This is what I'm collecting at the moment with Jed Jaggard's uh, help. First Gulf, um, we've got a Mark 27 uh, May West, Tornado uh, Air Cruise Peck Tube. Um, Aircrew NBC suit, Aircrew NBC gloves, uh, the anti-G trousers, and then the, I can't remember the date of the boots, but yeah. 1964 pattern? Something like Something that? Something like, I think it's 68. 68 pattern, 68. as it's 68. Well, well, the, the ones I'm wearing, if I'll you... I'll put a note in the video. Yeah. I'll look down here, yes. I'm wearing my Mark II, uh, Mark II A, and my Mark um, 56 pattern boots, rather. Uh, and not much else, I've got my... It's rather warm today, isn't yeah, it? So that's, that's excusable. Yeah, shirt on yeah. and my war set, well, new pattern war service dress on underneath. Yes. And we'll go over to the desk. Uh, my blouse uh, for flying in uh, is Barafir. We'll show you Craig's in a moment, which is in Surge, but they're the same cut, largely. Uh, both new pattern. Um, chip bag or side cap. Various RF berets. Heliograph. You've got officers on the bottom, yep. warrant, warrant officer above that, and then other ranks, yeah. uh, sorry, other airmen yeah. at the top there. Uh, our heliograph, which is a common thing, very nice to use. Browning higher pyre, this is a nasty little Denix replica, but it's a good pocket filler. A lovely, lovely, lovely uh, walk around oxygen bottle for mm -hmm. things like Shackleton's. Uh, wartime observer harness. Uh, this is Craig's example, which is, as you can see, absolutely gorgeous. And these were also worn into the 50s? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. And Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Marvellous. That's our kit, really. Yes. Can All we borrow nice you, Craig? Position. Can we borrow you just yeah. to show the, the Surge okay. war service dress? Okay. And this is the Surge version of the, the new pattern uh, war service dress, which is the standard issue version that was issued to uh, other airmen. Uh, right through officers though as we've already seen here the Baratheer version which some officers would have tailor-made mm. so there we are that's a look at the RF display thank you very much chaps that's brilliant and the aircraft the RAF bods are displaying next to is a Jet Provost trainer which was a training aircraft introduced into the RAF in the 1950s okay so here we have Dean and he's going to run through this 70s Soviet infantry setup for me so take it away Dean okay so um, this is uh, this uniform is a Obrazet 1969-73, so this is a 1973 modification of uh, a uniform pattern introduced in 69. Uh, in 1973, for a very short while, they carried um, stripes on the sleeve that represent how many years of service you've done. So based on the fact that they're not there, you can say that it's from 73, the late 73, through till, uh, in this case, actually through till the 90s, the M88 Afghanka uniform wasn't really introduced in Germany uh, with the Soviet forces there until the very late 90s. That's so very much an Afghan specific bit of kit. It is indeed. Um, so in this case, uh, I do have a Yugoslavian bayonet, unfortunately, but everything else is uh, as it should be. You have a three cell magazine pouch for an AKM. Uh, it has a pocket for your cleaning kit, which I probably, yep, I can get out. Uh, which also can be contained in the butt of the rifle. So quite why they needed a pocket for it, I don't know. And ease there's of, ease also, of access maybe, who knows. Yeah. Yes, possibly. There's also an oil bottle for your rifle in the pouch as well, as your three magazines. You have a grenade pouch. Uh, so unlike the East German army, who carried their grenades only in their transport and then their pockets when they needed them, the Soviets always has them on hand. Mm -hmm. That's until the, the trial UTV stuff, isn't it? That's right, yeah, and then they had a yes. grenade pouch with that. Uh, gas moss bag is for... This is an earlier type. There is a later type with a button fastening, but it tends not to stay closed, I find. Uh, this is sort of suitable for early 70s, so... Probably... I'm under the impression that the button type was a, a 80s kind of thing. Uh, I'm not certain of that. I don't have a date for it exactly. Um, and that carries your gas mask. Um, you know, cleaning kits, things like that. Uh, on the back you have 
the wonderful old entrenching tool that dates right back to the First World War, which is ideal for cutting wood or anything else if you sharpen it up. Um, I haven't, but it is good fun. I have cut up a box with it, that's quite entertaining. And you have, again, a canteen that dates back to the war. In this case, this is a 1982 stamped example, um, but it's exactly the same. The rifle, this is a uh, 1976 Tula produced AKM, or I should say a replica thereof. This is actually an airsoft model um, with plywood furniture and in this case a Bakelite magazine, uh, also a Tula produced magazine. Um, the Bakelite magazines uh, turned up in I believe the 70s um, and so they kind of fit a bit better with what I'm doing. I would have a slant compensator on this normally rather than a muzzle nut, uh, but I've left it in another box and not brought it with me. Uh, so that's that's about it for the rifle, I suppose. Uh, Russian sling. Uh, they still use these now, so they're easy to come by. And fairly simple and straightforward. The helmet is the same as the ones that you would might have seen with the Afghan chaps. This is a um, SSH 68. Um, the best example for this for me for motor rifles would be um, either a 40M or a 60M which is the World War II pattern of helmet um, sometimes with a new liner and in both cases with a y, uh, y strap suspension system intended to stop it from sliding down your head but it never really works the problem with these is that you always need to wear a hat underneath because Russian helmets are sized so that you can wear a winter hat beneath them, just. If you don't, it really doesn't stay on your head very so you well. you have to wear the forage cap at all times. That's right, yeah. because otherwise yeah. it doesn't grip. Uh, it does mean, of course, that you can never get this looking neat, which is unfortunate. So, it can be quite uh, unbearable in, in heat like this, but luckily, due to the width of it, you get a nice bit of shade and you get some cooling air around your ears. So that suits me. Uh, the uniform itself is made of cotton, so again, in this kind of heat, it's much more bearable than... Uh, and that's pure cotton, is it? That's not, right, not pure a cotton in this case. There is uh, a smart version of this uniform, which is in a half wool, half cotton, I believe, uh, fabric. There's a dark green, um, as well as a parade uniform in the same fabric. Uh, the idea of the half wool uniform is for kind of guard duties, smart duties on barracks, things like that. Um, but it would be impossible to wear in this weather. So it's out of the question. Um, another interesting thing about the group of Soviet forces Germany is that, like early Afghanistan, colour shoulder boards were always used and generally always seen on manoeuvres. In reality, the soldiers were intended to remove their coloured shoulder boards and insignia and swap to subdue. But of course, the time taken to unstitch and then restitch after manoeuvres meant it was never done. Uh, and the same happened with Afghanistan when they first went in coloured insignia was worn and eventually taken off once they realised that it made them a bit of a target. Um, but generally, if you're doing Group of Soviet Forces Germany, you want the colour. And it gives people something to look at and something to identify you by. And motor rifles is always red. Um, many of the other branches are black. Um, anything Group of Soviet Forces Germany it will generally be, I believe, red or black. Green for border guards would be obviously based in Russia only. Um, and I suppose, I believe there's a shade of, sort of a shade, darker shade of red for, I guess it would be KGB at the time, uh, which I guess might be relevant, but I haven't personally seen it in photos yet. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Steve. Just one other thing is the boots. Are these... oh, yeah, so I actually picked these up today. I used to be wearing East German boots. These are uh, professional soldiers' boots um, rather than the Kurzer boots that are more well known because these are full leather. Um, the conscript boots, the Kurza, have these fake leather shafts which are supposed to be incredibly uncomfortable and unbearable. But they're a lot taller than, um, say, East German boots, in, whether uh, enlisted or professional soldiers' boots, and they have a much wider round of uh, toe. Um, so these, I mean, these are much nicer being all leather. Of course. Uh, I do need to do a bit of work on them. But yeah. Excellent. Having picked them up, that's... I was going to say, that's excellent. Thank you very much indeed for that. That's brilliant, Dean. Thank, Thank you. you. Cheers.